All right, we begin. To be honest, Grace I don't remember. I don't remember. All right, folks, here I am again. I'm live on my YouTube channel. Grace Girl, if you want, share the link in CP, uh, COG's room. What CP? Share it in your room, please, so they can see where the link is, so they can subscribe at least, you know. Welcome, folks. Tony, good to see you, friend. And good to see the rest of you. All right. Uh, this is just me. Is that Andrew Martin? Andrew Martin, are you in two places at one time? What's going on, bro? What's up, bro? Because Andrew Martin's here. He claims to be an atheist, but at heart he's in love with Jesus. But then there's someone in Paltok room that's an atheist. And yet he seems to be very friendly towards Christians, hostile against Islam, Andrew Martin. Is that your twin brother separated at birth? We're going to wait a few more minutes, folks. Wait for everyone to get here. That first session tired me out. It fried me out, guys, to be honest. It really fried me out. Just keep praying if God wants to use me, they'll give me the health I need. But more importantly, to keep me holy and pure and filled with Holy Spirit to be in love with Jesus. It's hard, folks. It's hard. This side of glory, I don't like to say eternity because creatures are bound to time, space, and place. And heaven is a dimension of time, space, and place that's similar to earth, but there are profound differences. Creatures live forever, but they're not timeless. Only God is timeless by nature. And I'll discuss that again in the near future. But on this side of glory, we're going to get tired. We're going to get frustrated. Some days we'll feel more energetic, more alive. Some days we'll feel more tired, more beat down. Some days we're going to be walking more victori victoriously over our flesh. And some days we're just going to be struggling with the flesh and succumb. Until Jesus Christ, our Lord, in his infinite love and mercy comes and transforms the, this earth as the Holy Spirit loosens my tongue and takes over my words and transforms our bodies if we are believers. This is only a promise for those who love Jesus and just destroys the effects of sin and Satan. No more fatigue, no more getting tired, <clears throat> no more pain, no more suffering, no more failures, no more disappointments. That's going to be a glorious day. And because Christ is real, he's alive, he's risen, that day will happen because Christ surely lives. And we love the Lord Jesus. We love you. Father, Son, Spirit, we love you. Wash us in the blood of Jesus. Fill us with the Spirit. Guide this conversation. Save me from error and stammering and confusion. Bless your people to understand in the power of the Holy Spirit. And give us the grace to live the Word of God for the glory of Jesus. And be in love with Jesus more. And love for each other for the sake of Jesus. And Father, please. Give me the health I need, my lungs, my chest, my throat. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And, Father, bless our loved ones. Bless my angels, my two precious girls. Be with them, love them, cover them with the blood of Jesus, fill them with the Spirit, and be with the loved ones, everyone here. Those are in need of you, even those who do not know that they're in need of you because they're looking for <clears throat> meaning. They're looking for love, peace, and joy. And they're looking for it in all the wrong places because you are the source of true love, true meaning, true peace, true joy. And a heart will always be restless until it finds rest in you, Father, in you, Lord Jesus, in you, Holy Spirit. And our hearts belong to you and we love you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Yes, that's right, Graham. You know, I like Graham. You know, I like Graham. He thinks he means well when he prays for me, but indirectly in his prayer, he's taking a shot. And I still love him, though. Did you catch how he dug the knife in, but he actually made sure he buttered it up? Notice what he just prayed for me. See, I love these guys. He doesn't know I'm a Syrian, and I'm witty, and I understand. Look what he says. Give you patience and wisdom. In other words, Graham is saying, brother, you're not patient, especially with me, and you need more patience because I'm sensitive. I don't want your my feelings. But anyway, all right, hold on, guys. <clears throat> I pray in Jesus' name by his grace. I'm not a stumbling block and I don't burden people. Right? You come here not because you want to be rebuked or chastened, because you want to hear Jesus speak to you through imperfect vessels like me. And I pray the Lord Jesus will speak to you and me to our hearts by the power of the Spirit, right? But I like that, Graham. 
I like that, Graham. You're good, man. By the way, are you Chinese, Graham? I don't want to generalize. Are you Chinese? Just curious. No, I wish I did, Assyrian. I wish I knew our father in Aramaic. Yeah, just curious. My friend, so do you have Chinese blood in you? Just curious. And if you do have Chinese blood, does your Chinese side speak Mandarin or Cantonese? You speak Mandarin or Cantonese? We're just waiting for a few more faces to show up. And we'll talk about the sons of God and I'll be done. And I'm going to need about a week to recover. I'm beat, man. I'm beat physically, emotionally, mentally. But Jesus Christ is our rest, right? All right, folks. So in this session, I'm going to talk about the sons of God. Hopefully we'll finish it. The kind of Assyrian that flies straight. Grace banned me in Paltok. Hey, Grace Girl, you have someone here named Adam Varnia saying you, you banned him in Paltok. I guess it was deserved. Uh, Orthodox, who cares whether I do or not? Let's not make it about him. Yes. Okay, let me tell you something. Is that Fred asked me the question? Firefly. Firefly. You know what a hasa is? Uh-oh. Hold on a second. We got a call. What's going on? I'm doing good. I'm just live streaming. What's up? Hold on, guys. What? No, it's okay. Go ahead. Yeah, they're here. I'm just. No, don't worry about it. Entertain each other, guys. What's up? Yeah. Mm
Yeah, sorry guys, that was a couple of minutes. Apologize for doing that to you guys. This is what stinks about the live stream. I wish I could edit it. But anyway, I'm going to need prayers for next week. Yeah, hold on. All right. Prayers for next week, folks. You guys remember my uh, trial? Was it what, November 28th? And I said it was pushed. Okay, what's next Thursday? What's next Thursday? All right, sorry about that. I did that. Uh, next Thursday is what date? What's the date? I forgot. You guys would know, right? Okay, the 12. Well, guys, big decision. December 12th, big decision, folks. That's where this corrupt legal system can try to come after me, but pray for me. I'm going to need miraculous intervention. Deliver us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, December 12th. So that's the big day. That's the big day where they're trying to get me for legal fees that my ex accrued, which I can't afford. So pray for miraculous protection. This is where I'm going to need Jesus to show up, and this is why I say I'm tired. Okay, so can you guys pray? December 12th is that big day now. That's when it's going to be finalized in Jesus' name. So pray for miraculous intervention, all right? Thank you, guys. December 12th, in Jesus' name. This wicked, corrupt system, this corrupt, wicked judge of the devil who's ordering me to pay something I can't afford. And I'm just being upfront, And it's not even my legal fees. It's not something I owe. It's my ex. Pray God saves me and delivers me out of it. I'm done. All right? I'm done because I can't fight this and I'm tired. Pray God will keep me planted here. All right? So I'm opening up to you guys for prayers in Jesus' name. So sorry. That's why I had to take this phone call. I apologize for walking away, but this is the nature of live stream. Right? Live stream. Sometimes you live stream, and that's what happens. Now, with that said, in Jesus' name, my shield, my Lord, my God, who protect me. Keep praying because yeah, hold on, follow the spirit. See the, the phrase. So I don't know. It's buffering. Here it's buffering, folks. Usually this internet connection is pretty good, but it's been buffering. Keep praying because this has been my battle for two years. Two years of a battle that only Jesus can fight, and it gets tiring. So do pray for miraculous intervention, protection for me and for my daughters. Because, folks, I'll be honest, it's tiring fighting a corrupt legal system and being punished for someone else's sin. It's tiring. And I just say by way of confession to all you guys, right? Yeah. Orthodox believer, can I can I ask you something, uh, brother? Are you their messenger boy that you're coming here and telling me what they did and didn't do? Do you feel like you're accomplishing something by telling me what they are saying, Orthodox believer? I'm just curious. As if we Christians who are in ministry don't have enough on our plate, you think it's funny to come in here and saying that Ali Dawa challenged me to fight when earlier you asked me about whether I'm going to fight Muhammad Nikab. What do you think you're accomplishing, brother? I'm just curious, right, guys? I mean, I don't know. Maybe you guys can help me understand. But you guys remember, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. What does a Christian accomplish by wanting to tell me what Mohammedans are doing, trying to get attention? Even if I knew or did know, what do you accomplish, Orthodox believer, by chiming in and distracting us with what Mohammedans are doing? I'm just, right? I'm just, well, you know. Baffle. And see, even the dogs of Satan are out attacking me. Someone says, another fake divorced Christian. So I'm fake because <clears throat> I'm divorced because of an ex. Anyway, I don't want to talk about her. May God have mercy on her. It's okay. The Lord knows. Unbelievable. Okay, sorry. It's buffering, guys. I don't know what's wrong with the connection here, but pray. All right, folks, can we make a deal? Let's not start distractions and be used of the enemy to distract right? Please, let's not. It was rough, the first session on John 3, 5. I wanted to finish it sooner than later, but because of all the distractions, right, it took much longer than necessary. Can I advise you guys? No, well, it's okay, not a, uh, even Christians with good intentions can bring about destruction. You know that, right, Nada? How many Christians have actually suffered because other Christians being naive, thinking they're doing something with good intentions only to get Christians in trouble. Has that happened to you guys? 
right? Christian means well, but in their ignorance and naivete, they do something that actually brings about greater destruction. Dimitri Wood, we say, Insha Rab, Insha Rab, meaning if the Lord wills, because of James 4 15. Insha Rab, James 4 15. Insha Rab. Okay. Let's focus, folks, please. Yep. A hey, grace girl, you have a dog over here. You see the children of Satan, this filthy dog says fake divorce Christian as if Christians don't get divorced because it's only his parents who are Christians or not divorced. And I guarantee you his parents are divorced and he doesn't even know whose father is. Okay. Now let's focus in Jesus name. Impeached his hair and Android Greek. Cowards. They hide behind computer screens and fake names because they're not men to identify themselves. Right? Cowards. Now, don't get me wrong. Let me be clear on that. Christian Prince is not a coward. The reason why Christian Prince doesn't unveil his identity, let me explain why, is because he has family members living in the Middle East, and he doesn't want the Muslims to terrorize them or kill them. So Christian Prince is hiding his identity for the safety of family members living in the Middle East, right? But in the case of David Wood and myself, we don't have family members living in the Middle East. Right. Even though we don't want people to harm our family members who have nothing to do. Who have nothing to do with what we're doing. So at times we do need to be very discreet in what we say about our whereabouts, not because we're afraid of ourselves. It's because we don't want people associated, affiliated with us to be harmed. And I'm going to mention someone that I can't give you the specific name. There is a Christian warrior that's out there in the public arena. And on YouTube, that person shows, you know, the, the, the face of the person is shown. You know what happened to that Christian warrior? Because I don't want to mention the name. You know what happened? To, you know what they did to two brothers of that Christian warrior? So I don't even want to give the gender. Listen to me, guys. Two of the brothers of this Christian warrior were murdered by Muslims when they found out that their sibling became a Christian as actively against Islam. And the two brothers were still Muslims, innocent of the activity of their sibling in preaching the gospel. Do you know that? Just to get back at that Christian, they murdered two brothers. And those two brothers were still Muslims. And this is recent. didn't happen too long ago. I just told Dimitri Wood, I'm not going to mention name. Who are they? It was your mother and your mother's sister, Dimitri Wood. Why would you ask me when I'm trying to protect the identity of the person? Okay. okay, so you understand why someone like Christian Prince has to remain hidden. You understand why David Wood, Anthony Rogers, myself, we're not hidden because we don't have family members in the Middle East. So we're not exposing their lives, but at the same time, we have to be discreet because we don't want them to come after people here that though related to us have nothing to do with our ministry. For example, just real quickly, I don't want to bore you with this stuff. Please, I hope I'm not boring you with this stuff. Okay. <clears throat> Did you know out of all my siblings, I'm the only one who is a professing Bible-leaving Christian? Although my siblings will identify as Christians, they're not active in ministry. They don't actively read the Bible. They don't actively go to church, right? And they're not actively involved in my ministry. You with me there? You get what I'm saying? So I don't want to jeopardize my family members who may not necessarily approve of what I'm doing, and they're not involved in my activities. Same with David Wood. You know, his, his brothers, his mother, they're not involved in ministry. So I just want to be clear that sometimes we have to be discreet because we don't want to expose family members, family members to harm because it's no fault of their own that we're actively involved in ministry. And I said this just to show you that I really don't have respect for cowards, dogs of Satan, children of Satan hiding behind fake names and coming and attacking people when those people have no reason to hide behind fake names and they can make their identities known because no one's life is in jeopardy. See my point? 
Those people I don't respect. And again, I and I'm not attacking you Christian brothers and sisters. Not you guys. Please don't take it the wrong way. I'm not trying to generalize and I'm not talking about you guys because you too as Christians know that as long as you're involved in Muslim ministry, you too may have to be discreet and protect your identity. I'm talking about those guys who have nothing to fear because they're not exposing themselves to harm. Right? Because they don't have the courage to stand for Jesus and attack false ideologies and satanic systems like Islam, but they sit there attacking Christians or putting their lives on the line because they're armchair warriors, right? Text, you know, champions. You with me there? So don't think I'm attacking you, brothers, sisters who have aliases, because you too are involved. I can see you're coming to Christian Prince's channel, David Wood's channel. You're coming to my channel. That means you have a desire to know the faith and also know Islam. And so you have to be discreet because Muslims can attack you or family members. I'm talking specifically, so I don't generalize, so you can understand my attack. Okay, Those so-called internet champions, warriors, whether they pretend to be Christian or not, will hide behind fake identities to attack the Christians who are vocal and in the limelight and putting their lives on the line. You see, they're all filthy dogs and I have no respect for them. So I hope you understand where I'm getting at. So don't think I'm attacking you because you have a nick, because you are Christians who love Jesus and are involved in exposing Islam. And you may have to be discreet with your identity because you have family members who may get attacked by Muslims. So I understand that. Believe me, I'm not attacking you. The person I was attacking obviously doesn't do any evangelism to Muslims, but just wants to bash Christians because he or she is a filthy dog of the devil, right? See, Serenity just said it. Look, our precious sister. She goes, she uses the same nick after being stalked. The stalker is still after her. See, that's the point. Rob Christian, anytime. Anyway, folks, let's begin because I'm going to talk about the sons of God. Sorry for distraction. As you can see, I'm a little tired because the first session took a lot out of me. And now notice as I'm starting the second session, I get word that my big date is December 12th. Bar a miracle of Jesus Christ, this wicked, evil, corrupt judge, this daughter of Satan can come after me for a fee that I did not accrue. You see the injustice in this. If it's something I deserve to pay because it was my debt, it's one thing. It's not. Pray, plead the blood of Jesus on me and my daughters. On December 12, I need God to show up miraculously and just to remove this wicked judge, this demon. May the Lord Jesus give her what she deserves and chasing her for destroying so many lives and protect us for his glory. In Jesus' name, Lord Jesus, we need you. In Jesus' name. Well, that said, let's begin, folks. Juan, one, one. Juan, one. how are you, buddy? Juan, you can come to my YouTube channel. Look, watch me live if you want. She'll post the link in the Pal Talk room. In Jesus' name, before I begin, how did you guys enjoy that in-depth discussion on John chapter 3, verse 5? John chapter 3, verse 5. Well, it's Sam, just to let you know, you guys know already, that uh, my ex-wife walked away and divorced me. Uh, she started a relationship, an uh, issue of adultery that didn't last, but she still used the legal system with a corrupt judge to destroy me, leave me penniless and homeless. And this judge ordered me to pay her legal fees, her legal fees, and now they're after me for 40000 of her legal fees, even though we appealed it to the appellate court, the judge doesn't want to wait. I need miraculous intervention in Jesus' name. Because it's not a debt that I own. I cannot pay, will not pay in Jesus' name. Amen? All right? Is that clear? And notice it's right around Christmas. All of this is coming up on me around Christmas. No, this is just me. That's not why. I know you think you know what you're talking about as an atheist. It's better to shut up instead of speaking in your stupidity. Because when you open your mouth, then you convince people that you really are stupid and not <clears throat> pretending to be. Don't chime in, friend. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the Christians in all my situation. Don't be a lawyer and pontificate. Just sit back and relax and shut up. Okay, okay, folks. How'd you guys enjoy that discussion on John chapter 3, verse 5? John chapter 3, verse 5. I speak Assyrian, or Aramaic, Assyrian. John chapter 3, verse 5. Was it clear 
for those of you who listen. No, you are stupid because you're an atheist, because that says, the fool says there's no God. So the atheism simply confirms you are stupid. And the more you are steeped in atheism, the stupider you get. Yeah. Okay. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was an in-depth discussion on John chapter 3, verse 5. We really went into context, and I hope you learned one thing, though. Let's begin in Jesus' name. I hope you learned one thing, the importance of interpreting things in their contexts. And it will sound like a broken record. In their context, right? In their context, right? So sometimes context means looking at the chapter itself or looking at what that statement means in the context of the book as a whole or looking at what that statement means in light of its historical context, historical situation, right? Right? Okay. So with that said, go back and re-listen to that because I believe I made a powerful case for what the meaning of water and spirit happens to be in its own context. Just go back and listen to it. Re-listen to it until it becomes second nature. And if you still disagree with me, that's fine. We can agree to disagree. Just don't bash me. Let's just learn by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Chaldean Assyrian, don't let Firefly distract you into a side discussion. Do focus because I want you to learn because we're going to finish the discussion on the sons of God. I did two previous sessions on the sons of God. I explained what sons of God can mean. It has a range of meaning, right? I'm not going to repeat it. Go back and listen to the two previous sessions because I went in depth on the various shades of meaning, nuances of meaning that the Bible assigns to the term son of God. So God can be your father in a variety of senses, and you can be a son of God or daughter of God in a variety of senses. Because I want to now look at passages where angels, angels are called sons of God and explain why are they called sons of God and what's the significance of angels being labeled sons of God. Are we ready by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus name? Are we ready? Okay. Let's go to the most obvious passage that speaks of the sons of God. Job 38 verses 4 to 7. Focus with me and help me to help you and ask the Lord to bless. Say Christian, my big date, huh? December 12th, Aziza. You know what I'm talking about. Dandana. Yam Sheikha Paraklan. Say Christian knows who we're dealing with. Say Christian can tell you what we're dealing with. A demon masquerading as a judge. Anyway, Job 38, 4 to 7. Let's read. Tire, tire, us, out. tire us out. Yep, worse than Jezebel. Where wast thou, God speaking to Job, talking about the foundation of the earth? And he's asking Job a series of questions that Job cannot answer. Now, why is God asking Job these questions? To humble him. What's the point of this conversation? See, I have to go in depth. Every time I want to do something, make it simple. I have to go in depth and by the grace of God's spirit, simplify it. God is telling Job, when you can answer these questions, then you have a right to sit in judgment on me and question my wisdom and why I allow things to happen the way they do. When you can answer these questions, then you can tell me why I allow this calamity to take place in your life. If you can't answer these questions, then know your limitation. Know that you don't know everything. Know that I know everything and trust my character and trust me that what happened to you, there was a reason, though you may not understand the reason. You understand what God is doing here? See, side Christian, snapshot what he just said. This corrupt judge has destroyed many lives, his included. So, you know, I'm not lying. I'm not bearing false witness. Okay. Now, you understand what the point of these questions are? Let me give you the theology of Job so you can understand the point of the questions. Okay. He's trying to get Job to realize you are imperfect, temporal, and finite, and cannot see all things clearly, and cannot see the way I see. And so be a little more humble. Don't assume that these calamities have 
overtaken you because of whatever reason. Trust my character. Trust my judgment. Trust my wisdom. I know what you do not know. I see what you do not see. And my wisdom is perfect, unlike yours. And there's a reason why this calamity has overtaken you. Just learn not to question, but trust me. Now, understand, when he says trust me, he's not saying you can't ask questions. You cannot wrestle with God. You cannot fight with God. You cannot agonize with God. But God is saying at the end of the day, no matter what, you need to trust me because I see what you do not see. I know what you do not know. And things are happening to you for a reason. And my wisdom is perfect. My mercy is perfect. My love is perfect. Don't doubt it. Now, Karm said something beautiful. That's one of the hardest parts of being Christian. Tell me about it. For these past two years, God has allowed me to be stretched. Sam, you're in good position. You'd be very scared of getting married. Very scared. Be very scared. Okay. In these past two years, God has allowed me to be stretched by a legal system and an adulterous woman to such an extent that I thought pretty much my circumstances were going to overwhelm me and drown me and destroy me. Right? And I, too, wrestle with God. I'll give you an example. I'm trying to make this not just theology but practical theology, theology that applies in our lives right, that will anchor in our souls and how it affects our lives. I would never imagine a day in which I'd be, I would be forced to be put in a situation where I would not see my angels since June. And God only knows when I'm going to see them again. I'd never imagine a day where I would be put in such financial debt, a debt I did not <clears throat> accrue, a debt accrued by someone because of dishonoring God by being <clears throat> meritly unfaithful and a corrupt legal system rewarding the sinner and punishing the person who was wrong. Right? Are you with me there? Let me make it a little practical before I go into the theology. Okay? And so I too wrestle, struggle, and agonize. But you know what? I know at the end of the day, Jesus is God. Jesus is alive. Jesus is risen. He is reality. Nothing is going to change that. Jesus is in love with me. He's in love with every one of you. Nothing's going to change that. And Jesus told me, I'll go through trials, but he'll preserve me by his power that the trials will not swallow me whole, engulf me, and destroy my faith. Are you with me there? You get it? Now, let me explain to you what was not told to Job so you can get the, the – I hope you guys don't mind that I'm going a little in-depth on Job so you can understand what's going on here. Okay, let me explain to you what was not told to Job. Job was never told by God why God permitted all hell to break loose on his life, where he lost ten children, seven sons, and three daughters. He lost his servants. He lost his wealth. And he was stricken with a disease, afflicted with a disease that was debilitating. And had three men who thought they were Christian, godly, wise Christian, agonizing him, torturing him by saying, you must have sinned against God for God to do this to you. It's not possible that if you're righteous, this would happen to you. Showing you what bad theology does. You understand the danger of fools, unwise fools who think they know the Bible and distort the Bible to their shame and destruction? And we squit the Bible and misuse the Bible to add affliction and misery to people who already were suffering. Right? This is a lesson to every one of us. Not every one of us should presume to be teachers. Not every one of us should be arrogant enough to think we know the Word of God to such an extent that we can diagnose, or I should say, give a prognosis about a situation. Because we think we understand the Bible and why this person is going through what he or she is going through. Because then you may end up like Job's unwise, foolish friends whom the Lord rebuked and said they need to repent and make atonement to be forgiven.
right? You with me there? Okay. Now, I'm going to answer the question for you guys. Exactly, Blue, Blue Penny. That's my state. I'm going to answer, I'm going to answer the question for, your, for you guys. Why Job was allowed to be struck by Satan, even though God didn't tell Job the reason, but we're given the reason. We're given the reason in chapter 1 and 2. Can I give you a quick summation of why the Lord allowed the devil to do what he did to Job? Are you ready for the answer so you can learn? Go a little in depth. You ready for the answer? That's given to us in Job chapter 1 and 2 if we understand. I just want to know if you want to read this. Okay, here's the answer. It is not a coincidence in Job chapter 1 verse 6 and Job chapter 2 verse 1. It says, there was a day in which the sons of God, meaning angels, we'll get back to that, the meaning of it, but the sons of God, approached Jehovah, the Lord, and Satan was among them. Understand what the author wants you to see. He wants you to see that there are three groups in this scene. Jehovah, Yehovah, the Lord, the sons of God, and Satan. So there are three groups here. And then the Lord knows why Satan has come. Because if you read it carefully, he says, where have you come from, Satan? He goes traveling to and fro the earth, up and down the earth. Notice that tells us that Satan's not omnipresent. He can't be in multiple places at the same time. He can travel from place to place real quickly, but still, because he's a temporal being, he can't be omnipresent. Now, why is he traveling the earth to and fro the earth? That's his response. I'm, I've been searching the earth. God tells us, you've considered my servant Job, haven't you? See, so God knows why he's there. He's saying, have you considered my servant Job? In other words, you've looked for a victim, for a prey. Because in 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9, we are told that Satan is like a lion on the prowl. He's a roaring lion, a lion, a vicious roaring lion on the prowl, looking for a victim, a prey to consume, to devour. That's 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9. 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9. And so he found someone, and God knows that Satan has his eyes on Job, and he explains why. You have your eyes on my servant Job because he's a righteous man who holds his integrity and there's no one like him in all the earth. And Satan says, it's not for, for no reason that Job fears you. The reason why Job fears you, God, it's not because he's righteous. It's because of the blessing you've given him. You've given him 10 children, beautiful wife. You've made him rich, given him plenty. Of course he loves you. But he doesn't really love you for you. He loves you because of the provision. Understand what's taking place here and who happens to be listening to this conversation. Pay attention. The sons of God are listening to this conversation. God says one thing about Job and Satan says another thing. The sons of God are hearing God say, Job is a righteous servant who fears me. There's no one like him in all the earth. And Satan says, that's not true, God. He only loves you because of what you give him. He doesn't really love you. It's not unconditional. So now Satan has called God's judgment into question and Job's integrity into question before the sons of God. See what's happening? And remember, Satan was like them, a spirit creature who had the potential to sin and doubt God and sin against God. So you understand Satan's mastermind? Satan's mastermind? Satan wants to cause the sons of God to doubt God and turn against God like he did. You catching it? He's actually trying to cause war in heaven. Turning the sons of God against God. You focus now. Focus, guys. Focus with me. Focus with me. Forever King, which part of the, what I just said wasn't clear? That God said he's righteous and God-fearing. How could you call himself righteous? Are you saying God didn't know what he's talking about? So you're not paying attention again. Unbelievable. Okay. So you just agreed with Satan. 
Good job, Forever King. Why would you ask me the question when I just explained what the Bible says? Everyone with me there? Okay. You see why God allowed Satan to do what he did? Because Satan was now questioning God's judgment of Job, just like Forever King started questioning. Was he self-righteous? I just told you, Forever King, that God said he is God-fearing and righteous. There's no one like him in the earth. Oh, Sam, was he self-righteous? Gee, God, hold on. You just said, God, that he's righteous, fears you. There's no one like him in the earth. Maybe he was self-righteous, God. Okay? Do you understand what the debate is now? Is God right or is Satan right? Is God's judgment of a person correct or is Satan right to question Job? And if Satan is right, you know what that means? You can't trust God's judgment. God's judgment may not always be correct. You see how much is at stake? He's calling into question God's judgment, Job's integrity, to get the sons of God to doubt God and question God to turn them against God. Everyone with me, you understand why God is about to allow this to happen? Because imagine what the angels, the sons of God would have thought if God simply banished Satan from his presence and says, get, get out of my face, get out of my presence, don't ever stand before me. That would not have alleviated any potential doubts in the hearts of the sons of God. It may have actually strengthened any doubts because they would start wondering, why did God get so angry so quick and banish Satan? Could there be some truth to what Satan said? You with me there? So if he simply banished him, that still would not have resolved any potential doubts in the hearts of the sons of God. Netta, I don't know why you keep re repeating the same point over and over again, sister. I don't understand either. I'm confused. You with me there? You guys understanding the point or am I losing you guys? So God could have banished him and not care what the angels thought. Or God could have chosen another way. And what is the other way? Okay, go ahead. Test him. And we will see who's right. Did you know that Job's response would have affected so much in the heavenly realm? Understand the implication for you and I. Your actions on earth will impact the things in heaven. Your actions on earth have a huge impact in the heavenly realm. So in order to prove Satan a liar and to vindicate Job and to assuage any doubts in the hearts of the sons of God, so that the sons of God would never doubt God's judgment of anyone. He allowed Job to be tested so that when Job passed the test, God could say to the sons of God, you see, you see what a kind of wicked, filthy liar the enemy is? Don't ever, ever trust him for a second. You got it now? So what God was doing was he was going to bat for Job in heaven. He was coming to the honor and integrity of Job and also trying to prevent the sons of God from entertaining any doubts and being deceived by the evil one. So this was actually in an act of love and mercy on the part of God coming to the defense of his servant and trying to protect the sons of God from rebelling like the devil. You got it now? You understand? So if you actually read the book of Job with this understanding, you see God's intense love for Job and the sons of God. And he didn't want the sons of God to be perverted and corrupted by the lie of Satan. 
and came to the honor of Job saying, no, I know Job, you don't. And I know what kind of man he is. He's not what you accuse him to be. So bring it on, Satan. You want me there? Unrelated question, holy tornado. Ask me that later. And guess what, folks? The end of chapter 1 and 2 says, Job passed the test. Job chapter 2, verse 10. Forever King, you need to go, friend. Get Forever King out of here. He's not here to listen. This arrogant twit thinks he knows what he's talking about because he thinks he's going to use Elihu against me. Yeah, another idiot who thinks he knows what he's talking about. Job chapter 2, verse 10. Watch here. Let's read. See, this is another fake, pretending to ask questions because he wants answers, but he thinks he knows because Elihu wasn't rebuked by God. See what? Uh, idiot. Again, idiots. I'm dealing with idiots. Protestant before the rapture. Don't leave us behind. Job chapter 2, verse 10. Okay. But he said unto her, his wife said, curse God and get it over with. But Job 2.10, look what Job says. But he said unto her, thou speakest as one of the foolish woman speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the end of God and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. What else do you want? End of story, Job passed the test. Satan was proven to be a liar. Job was vindicated. God's judgment was proven right, and the sons of God saw what an evil, wicked being Satan is to question God's judgment and the integrity of God's servant. So Job passed the test and affected the heavenly realm in passing the test. You caught it? So then what's the rest of the story of Job? Then, Shreed, you have no idea of the Bible and the potential capacity for sin in creatures. It wasn't Satan in the presence of God, and he rebelled. Didn't Adam and Eve walk in the presence of God, and they rebelled? Jesus was on earth and did miracles before their eyes, and his apostles abandoned him, and Judas betrayed him. And even John the Baptist, when he was in prison, started doubting whether Jesus was the one. Israel saw God in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night and saw the Red Sea split before their eyes and the plagues. And they still started worshiping calves right in front of the cloud. The cloud right in front of them. They started worshiping the calf and started complaining, why would you bring us to the desert? We're going to die. You really underestimate the power of sin. Shreed it. And you make angels and humans more than they are. You really underestimate how powerful sin can be in a heart that's not made perfect yet. You truly do. Okay. But coming back to the issue, then what's the rest of the story? The rest of the story is not Job complaining because he hates God. It's Job complaining from a heart that's broken. Let me explain to you the story of Job. Job is heartbroken because he feels the one being that he loves the most has turned against him and become his enemy, and he doesn't understand why. That's his story. Are you with me there? The story of Job is a friend who thinks that his best friend whom he loves has turned his back on him and hates him for no reason, and he's agonizing, why would he do this to me? What have I done to him? the one that I've loved the most. Why would he do this to me? So his complaint is not out of the attitude, look, you took everything away from me, then I don't care about, no, no. How could you do this to me? You, whom I love the most and trusted in the most, who I tried to honor and walk in integrity and tried to avoid grieving by avoiding all these major sins, what would make you turn against me and do this to me? Why would you hurt me this way, seeing that you are the one that I love the most and I trusted in the most? It's a story of a man who thinks that his best friend has turned his back on him and hates him.
You with me there? And Job was wrong for thinking that. That's not saying, but he didn't sin in saying, you know what, the heck with God. I don't care about God. He took away my blessings. No, he was wrong in thinking God had turned his back on him. That was the sin. You understand the point? But why did he think that? Not out of hate for God, not out of unbelief where he no longer believed in God, said the heck with God. I won't. It's out of his love for God and trust in God that he was heartbroken. You get it now? You understand the story of Job? So what Satan wanted Job to do is lose faith, curse God, and say to heck with you. He didn't do that. So his complaint wasn't what Satan was looking for. His complaint was more of the one I love the most, the one I considered my friend, the one I honored to the best of my ability, trying to avoid sin as much as possible. What would make you turn your back on me and hate me so much and do this to me when I trusted you and loved you and considered you my friend? Why would you turn against me? Why do you hate me so much? What did I do for you to hate me? That's his agony. That's his agony, right? So God shows up and teaches him a lesson. Job, I'm going to answer your question if you can answer this. Were you there when I created the heavens and the earth and put things in motion? No. Do you understand how lightning works and how the snow falls? No. Job, then never, ever, ever question my wisdom and never doubt my love for you and never doubt my faithfulness. It wasn't God rebuking Job because he hated Job or Job was saying something blasphemous and, and Job had turned. No, it was more of don't you dare think. Don't you dare think I would ever abandon you. And don't you dare think for a moment that I hate you. Don't you dare think for a moment I turned my back against you. I'm not that kind of God and I'm not that kind of friend. I am faithful to you till the end. You understand the point? You understand? The point, what God is doing here? He's saying, Job, don't question my wisdom. Don't question my ways. Don't question the things that happen to you and assume that they're happening to you because I've turned my back against you and hate you. No, Job, that's not it at all. Job, I will never turn my back against you. I will never hate you, but I am your friend to the end and forever, and I love you with an everlasting love. That's right, the line from Batman. You understand the story of Job now? With that in context, you understand why it happened. If God simply banished Satan, which he could have, that would not have assuaged any doubts in the hearts of the sons of God, so to vindicate Job and vindicate his judgment and prove that Satan is a wicked liar that you cannot trust, he allowed it to happen so he can say to the sons of God, do you see? Never, ever trust what this wicked being has to say. Never, ever. You see the point now? In light of that, does it make sense? Is it making more sense? So it makes you see how evil Satan is, how unreliable Satan is, and how beautiful God is. Now, with that said, let's go to Job 42, 7 to 10. Let me break this down. Let me break this down so I can go back to Job 38. Watch here. Job 42, 7 to 10. Now, notice what God does here. 
Here again, God is amazing. I want you to see the depth and beauty of Scripture. Job 42, 7 to 10, the depth and beauty of Scripture. And it was so that after Jehovah had spoken these words unto Job, Jehovah said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. Why would God say that Job has spoken right? Because behind Job's painful words was a recognition that God is your friend, your lover, and I mean spiritually, obviously, who cannot ever forsake and abandon you and turn his back in, against you and hate you when you're walking in communion with him. So Job got the right idea, but he was wrong in thinking that God had turned his back on him. You get the point? So Job got the right idea. He is a faithful God and a loving God, and you're walking in communion with him. He'll never hate you and turn his back on you for no reason. And I haven't sinned against him. I've tried to avoid sin and make him happy because he's my friend. And so he had the right idea, but was wrong in thinking that God had turned his back on him. And so God is condemning these unwise fools by saying, you were so stupid to think that he was being punished because he was wicked as if only the wicked suffer, not realizing that even the righteous can suffer and not necessarily because of me, because there's another being in this world who wants to afflict the righteous to make them doubt God. Right? Is it making sense? But let's read Job 42, 7 to 10 again. Let me, I'm going to go back, scroll. Verse 8, therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept. Notice what God did. He didn't simply direct them, uh, forgive him directly. Ask forgiveness, I'll forgive you. No, 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 no. He made it a little complicated. Take seven bulls and seven rams, offer a sacrifice to atone for your sin. Go to Job, have him pray for you. I'm going to explain to you why he did this in a minute. Now read 9 and 10. Lest I deal with you after your folly, in that you have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. He said it again. Now 9. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Nemethite went and did according as Jehovah commanded them. Job also accepted Job. Now watch this, verse 10. Let's post verse 10 one more time. Watch here. Exactly, Ujjal Ray. His heart was devastated because he couldn't believe that God had turned his back on him. Job 42.10. Watch here. And Jehovah turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, Job gave Job twice as much as he had before. I love this passage. Let's park on this. Unpack it. Notice when Job prayed for his friends, it says that's when God released Job from his captivity and restored to him twice as much. He got doubly blessed. Folks, look at what God did. God is saying, I will only forgive you when you bring this burnt offering for your sin and Job prays. So God deliberately designed it that they needed a mediator who would then officiate and provide sacrifices for the forgiveness of sin. A picture of Christ. A mediator between God and man who then officiates and mediates on the basis of a sacrifice for sin. So you're seeing Job as a picture of Christ. Atoning for those who were his accusers who condemned him and accused him unjustly. Right? You got it? But what's beautiful about Job 42.10? Job turned the captivity, God turned the captivity, captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Okay. Do you know why? Job could not pray from his heart for the forgiveness of his friends if he had hate in his heart for them. So God not only used Job's mediation to forgive them, but used Job's mediation to heal Job 
of any hatred or malice in his heart, setting him free from that captivity, healing his heart to pray genuinely from a heart full of love and forgiveness in order to restore him. You got it? So the prayer wasn't just for their benefit. It was for Job's healing and restoration and release. God released them from captivity, one of which would have been he would have been captive to any hatred or maliciousness that he would have stored in their hearts for falsely condemning him. Thank you, Daniel Mayweil. You caught it? You see how beautiful scripture is? You see how the depth of scripture is? When you pray for people who have wronged you, it's not just for their benefit, it's for your benefit so that that prayer will heal you by the Spirit to release any hatred you have for them because you cannot pray for their restoration sincerely if your heart is full of hate for them. You understand what you're learning? Praying for your enemies is for your good, not just their benefit. Because you cannot generally pray for someone who has wronged you from your heart if you don't truly love them. So that prayer is healing you and releasing you of being in bondage to your hatred towards that person. You caught it now? Do you see the wisdom of God, the beauty of God, the depth of God's word? Exactly sort of truth. If I'm truly praying for an enemy that God would bless them and restore them, then for that prayer to count, it has to be from a genuine heart full of love and compassion. You see what you're learning from the book of Job. And now let's read Job 42, 10 to 12. I want to do a fourth session. Job 42, 10 to 12. Job 42, 10 to 12. And Jehovah turned the captivity of Job, catch it, not only captivity to his affliction, but also any hatred in his heart. When he prayed for his friends, notice when he did it, when he prayed for his friends. Also, Jehovah gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now notice how God will restore the fortunes you've lost. Watch here. Then came there unto him all his brethren. All his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before, and did eat bre bread with him in his house, and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that Jehovah had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and everyone an earring of gold. So Jehovah blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, whereas before he had 7,000, 6,000 camels, whereas before he had 3,000, if you read Job chapter 1. A thousand yoke of oxen, whereas before he had 500 and a thousand she asses. He doubled it. But the only thing he did not double, he did not double the number of his children. And we're missing that part. Job 42, 42, 10 to 12. There's a part missing. I don't know why. It's missing. Folks, where's that part with the kids, buddy? Yes, I'm a Syrian. Oh, I'm sorry. It's 13. You sure? Other well, translates 12. He also had seven sons and three daughters. Now, notice what he did not double. I apologize, brother. I thought it was 12. So even computer should not. Notice he didn't double his children. He had seven sons, three daughters. He ended up with seven sons and three daughters. But the ox and everything's he doubled. You know why he didn't double children? Because this shows you that the value of human life is equal to another life. Right? Human 
lives are equal in the sight of God. You see? Seven sons were replaced with seven sons. Three daughters with three daughters. But in a sense, they too were doubled because now he has 20 children living with him in glory. 14 sons and six daughters. So he had double children as well who are now with him in glory forever. He started with 10 children, all die. And he ended up with 10 more children. And human life is equal to human life. That's why it's life for life. So if you kill me, you don't take two lives for me. Human life equal human life. So seven sons replaced with seven sons. Three daughters replaced with three daughters. So it's not so much they're replaced because you cannot replace children in your heart. But now he has 20 children who now dwell with him forever in the presence of Jesus. 20. But Angela, it's making sense now? So you didn't catch it then when you say, okay. It's not so much replacing as it's showing human life equals human life. Life for life. You can't double, right? My life is not equivalent to two human lives. Life for life. So you got seven sons in place of the seven he lost, three daughters in the place of the three daughters he lost, not because they can be replaced, but so that God would now give him 20 children to dwell with him forever in glory. How you doing, amen? How you doing, Juan? Everyone got it? Did it sink in? You don't replace a child with a child. Children are irreplaceable. So it's not so much he's replacing them as he's restoring a family. He's restoring a family for Job. So he wouldn't be childless. You get it? And he's given him the same number of children because life for life. My life is not equivalent to two human lives. But in giving him 10 more children... Job now has 20 children to enjoy forever and ever. And at the resurrection, where they're restored to their bodies made immortal, he'll have 20 children that belong to him, dwelling with him forever in the presence of Jesus Christ. Clear? Before I move on? And remember now, Job is in glory. He has all 20 children with him in glory before the feet of Jesus. No more pain, no more suffering, no more agony, but perfect peace, love, and joy with his 20 children. So though you may lose a child here temporarily, know and rest assured and be convinced of this. Your pain is temporary, but then the morning star will arise the day star will appear jesus christ will dawn in our hearts destroying the darkness and the misery <clears throat> that engulfs us where we will see our children again and dwell in their presence and death will never separate separate us ever again i hope that's sinking in Do you see the beauty, the majesty, the depth of the word of God if we understand it by the grace of God's spirit? The beauty, the depth, the majesty of the word of God. Clear? And now we better appreciate the story of Job. With that said, let me now go back to Job 38. You see, I had to unpack this too. I don't know where I'm going to visit you, tinfoil hat. Yeah. Now let's go to Job 38, 4 to 7 and finish it. Verses 4 to 7.
Where was thou, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Notice he's saying, were you there, Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth? Of course he wasn't. There were no humans. But notice it says that when God finished creating the earth, the sons of God, all the sons of God, not some, all the sons of God shouted for joy. You guys see it? Job 38, verse 7. Question. Who possibly could these sons of God be when the earth's foundation was created and there was no human beings on earth? Job 38, 7. These sons of God, all of them, right, shouted for joy when they saw God create the earth. Who possibly could these sons of God be when there were no human beings when God laid the foundation of the earth? You got it. So here's proof. Angels are called the sons of God. But I want you to remember one thing, though. These sons of God were passive observers. If you read, they simply observed God creating the earth. They did not get involved. Al Darius, all the sons of God are fallen angels. Reread it, brother. All the sons of God rejoiced when he laid the foundation of the earth. They're all fallen angels? Reread it. Think about it. You got it now? Because he said fallen angels. Who said they're all fallen? Every one of them? It's the angelic host. At that time, none of them had fallen, and not all of them fell. None of them had fallen, and not all of them fell. You get it? But what I want you to catch and observe and pay attention. Pay attention, catch, and observe. These sons of God were passive observers. They only looked at God creating. They didn't help God to create, right? They were looking at God, laying the foundation of the earth, creating it by himself. They didn't involve themselves. They didn't help him. They just looked and were elated at what they saw their creator create. You got it? Do you know why this is powerful, you Trinitarians? Notice it says all, not some of the sons of God. All the sons of God saw, observed, and were elated at God creating, and he did it by himself. That's proof for you that Jesus is not one of these mere created sons of God because Jesus, the son of God, didn't simply observe. He was there creating with the Father and the Spirit. Right? So then how can Jesus be one of these angelic sons of God, these angelic creatures, a mere created son of God, when he didn't simply observe, but he actively was involved in creating the heavens and the earth with the Father and the Spirit? So this passage is another proof Jesus is no mere spirit creature. He is Jehovah, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Sinking in? So another text that shows Jesus is no mere spirit creature, a created son of God, because he didn't simply observe Jehovah create and rejoice. He was personally involved in creating all things and sustaining all things. So he too is that Jehovah that the rest saw creating. Right, He, too, is that Jehovah, one with the Father and the Spirit, that the rest saw creating because he wasn't simply a passive observer. He was actively involved in creating the heavens and the earth and sustaining them with the Father and the Spirit, showing that he, too, is that Jehovah that all the other sons of God saw creating. That's the point I want you to take. Right?
Now, what's the point? Angels are called sons of God. Job 1 verse 6, another place where they're called sons of God. Job 1 verse 6, another place where they're called sons of God. I don't need to remind you the verses where it says Jesus created all things, right? If you want, I'll just give them to you. You can write them down. Give them to you. You can write them down. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Jehovah, and Satan came also among them. Notice three groups. They came to present themselves before Jehovah. Well, Jehovah is in heaven at this time. So these sons of God are not human beings. They're angelic creatures who are there with Satan. Right? So clearly, this refers to angels. Job 2.1 repeats this. Job chapter 2, verse 1. Job 2, verse 1. Job 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Jehovah, and Satan came also among them to present himself before Jehovah, the Lord, Yehovah. So clearly, this is in heaven. The sons of God are not humans. They must be angels. So here we have three references in the book of Job to spirit creatures, created spirit beings in heaven called sons of God. The question is, why are they called sons of God? Well, Obviously, one of the reasons why they're called sons of God is because God created them, gives them life and their powers, their authority, and sustains them, right? So they're a son of God in the sense that God created them, sustains them, gives them their powers, their authorities, their abilities, and their life. Otherwise, they would not exist, could not move, have their being, could not live. So in one sense, that's why they're sons of God. Right Now, there may be another reason why they're called sons of God. Again, the Bible doesn't come out and tell us, so this is an inference. Another reason why they may be called sons of God is because they share in God's nature to a limited extent. Meaning, God by nature is spirit, but he's a different kind of spirit. And they are spirit creatures, spirit beings with spirit body. So in that sense, they resemble God in that they are spiritual. Right. And thirdly, the reason why they may be called sons of God is because they dwell in God's heavenly presence in heaven with God appearing visibly to them. So they may be called sons of God in the sense that they are heavenly beings like God is in heaven visibly before their eyes. You with me there? So they're called sons of God for the following reasons. The Bible doesn't come out and say it. But this is an inference we're making. Number one, angels are called sons of God because God created them, gives them their life, their powers, their abilities. Otherwise, they could not exist. And he can wipe them out of existence in a nanosecond. They cannot rival his power. Secondly, they're called sons of God in that they resemble God in that they're spiritual beings, like God is a spiritual being, but God is a different kind of spiritual being, right? Because these angels are spirits with spiritual bodies and shapes of some kind. God by nature is bodiless and shapeless. And the other reason why they may be called sons of God is because they are heavenly beings dwelling with God in heaven before God's heavenly presence. All of the above, Alex Gaskin, I'm saying, all of those interpretations are plausible in light of the fact that at times they're called sons of God in contrast to earthly beings. But in one sense, every creature is a son of God. So why contrast them? Because here, son of God in reference to them can mean that they are heavenly beings. Their dwelling place is heaven where God dwells in visible glory whom they behold even though he's hidden from our sight on earth. No, camel, that's not the reason. Because in one sense, Satan was called the son of God. And even falling creatures are called gods. No, that's not the sense, Camel. And I'll get into that a little more. But I just want to be clear that sons of God in reference to the angels 
have the following meanings. In other words, this is why they may be called the sons of God. Nothing explicit. Nothing explicit. It's inference, implicit. We know that they're created and God gives them life and their powers and potencies and their intelligence. So that obviously is true. God created them, gives them life, their powers, their potencies, their intelligence, their wisdom, and can, can wipe them out with ease and they can't rival him. So in that sense, they can be called sons of God because God gives them life, right? Gives them their being. But that's true of everyone. Everyone who's created is a son of God in that sense. So there has to be something unique about them being called sons of God. So what would make them unique in terms of their sonship? Unlike human beings who are earthly dwell dwellers created from the earth with physical bodies, they are heavenly beings, heavenly creatures created to dwell in heaven who are spirit beings like God is a spirit being, but he's a different kind of spirit being. They are spirit beings with spiritual shapes that limit them to time, space, and place. Right? Did everyone get the definition of the sons of God in reference to angels? Is that clear? True, they are created and given life and sustained by God. But that's true of every creature. Every creature is a son of God in that sense, even Satan. So there has to be something more to it. And at times they're called sons of God in contrast to earthly dwellers. Well, why are they called sons of God in contrast to those on earth? Because most plausibly and most likely it's because they are heavenly beings, spiritual beings created to live in heaven where God dwells in visible glory whom they behold. And like God, they are spiritual beings, not physical beings, spirits that are embodied in flesh. They are spiritual beings with spiritual shapes. So they resemble God in being spiritual beings, but God is a different kind of spiritual being. God is spirit in that he is shapeless, bodiless, timeless, formless. They are spirits in that they are spiritual creatures with spiritual shapes that don't possess bodies composed of earthly matter. Their bodies do, are not created from the earth. Their bodies are not composed of earthly matter. Okay, so is that clear? Did we get the definition here? So are angels called sons of God? Most definitely. Why are they called sons of God? I gave you some plausible reasons. But for the fact of the matter, the Bible doesn't come out and tell us the reason. It's something we must infer by studying the context carefully. Right? Hold on, but hold on one second, guys. All right, everyone got it? I gotta see, man. This guy, man, he kills me. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to find, man. This guy's keyboards, man. It's all erased. Hold on, buddy. Sorry about that. Man, dude. Hold on. Grace Girl, do I have to do your job for you? Come on, Grace Girl. Get to the program. This guy's keyboards, man. Sorry. Everyone got it now? Why you have Kaichu distracting? Send him on his merry way, Grace Girl. Come on. You don't get paid for nothing. Hold on, sister. Sorry about, so, sorry about that. This guy's keyboard, this guy's so prehistoric, he's got a keyboard where the letters are erased. You can't find the D. Can you believe this? Look at this keyboard. My goodness. Dude, do I have to pay you for a new keyboard? And uh, it, there's no D. Okay, I found the D, finally. Man. 
I found it. Oh, well, I lied. I thought I found it. I just found the D, man. Oh, but a giddy giddy. What happened, bro? All right, man. Come on, Grace Girl. Once I find the D, I'm going to bounce you, Grace Girl. Anyway, you guys got it? Everyone got it? Is it clear? Angels are sons of God. Let me end it with this. Angels are sons of God. Obvious because God created them, gives them life, their potencies and wisdom, and he can wipe them out of existence in a nanosecond. In that sense, everyone is a son of God, a daughter of God. But they're also sons of God because they are heavenly beings who dwell with God in heaven, beholding his visible glory, and they're spiritual beings whose spiritual shapes are not composed of physical matter, earthly matter. So there are spirits like God is spirit, but there are different kinds of spirits, right? Clear? Hope that was all clear. Is that clear? Okay, with that said, by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to do a part four tomorrow because I've given you enough meat in these two sessions. First session, we went really in depth on John 3, 5. What does it mean to be born of water and spirit? And now I explain to you why Job was permitted to suffer so you can see the justice of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the kindness of God, the beauty of God, and even permitting that, and how evil and unreliable Satan is, and how he goes out of his way to try to destroy lives and destroy unity and cause people to turn against God both on earth and in heaven, right? Clear? And now you saw what it means for angels to be sons of God. Now, with that said, if I have time tomorrow, because it's the weekend, if I'm able to get internet connection somewhere, I'll do a class. If not, Lord willing, I'll try to be on Monday. But, folks, my big day has come, December 12, 1130 a.m. Central Standard Time, 1230 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. God doesn't show up. They'll come after me for a debt that I do not owe, cannot pay, and they can try to make my life uncomfortable. I need to be planted here by the grace of God, and the Lord save me from this debt and save the money that he's given me to get on my feet for my daughters. Otherwise, it'll be more hell having to fight a corrupt legal system, and I'm tired, folks. So December 12th is a big day. I really need Jesus to show up, right? That'll sustain because it's tiring. I'm tired of this corrupt system. May God set me free, finally, in Jesus' name. December 12, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. So, Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow. Christ is risen, and he lives forever. He is Jehovah in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. May he cover us by his blood, cover my daughters by his blood. Lord Jesus, please, Lord, fight for us and save us from Satan, his children, from this system. Save us from our flesh. And Lord, please give me the grace to finish the race with honor to glorify you and bring my daughters to me, Lord, please. We need you. We love you. We depend on you. We trust in you, Lord Jesus. You are the son of God. We need you. Lord, please, we need you. And keep us in love with you and pure. Save us from the evil. And in Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we'll now see you guys tomorrow. Hope this blessed you guys.